is the author of the book, The Holy Mushroom, Evidence of Mushrooms in Judeo-Christianity. He co-authored the book, Astrotheology and Shamanism, Christianity's Pagan Roots, with Andrew Rutigy. He also co-produced the DVD, The Pharmacratic Inquisition, also with Andrew. He is the curator of the official website for John Marco Allegro, the much criticized Dead Sea Scroll scholar, and has contributed much to the re-examination of many of Allegro's theories. He is the editor of the upcoming Ethnogenics and Consciousness, a comprehensive overview of the psychedelic sciences, a two-volume set of interviews with about 50 of the world's leading independent and academic researchers in psychedelic studies, scheduled for release in late 2011. Young hosts the popular Gnostic Media podcast at www.gnosticmedia.com, a show that focuses on utilizing the ancient classical seven liberal arts of the trivium and the quadrivium, grammar, logic, rhetoric, math, geometry, music, and astronomy, bringing together both leading independent and academic researchers to discuss the ancient mysteries, education, politics, economics, and much more. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Don Urban. Thank you. Well, I'm going to have to move through the information quickly here. I've got a lot to present. And basically, as Bob Tuscan discuss, discussed earlier, the trivium is about critical thinking. And uh, I'm going to have to decide which microphone I want to use here. So let's start out with this one and see how it goes. And that is not clicking forward here. There we go. Okay, why are we here? Part one. <clears throat> Literacy is a form of slavery until a systematic form of critical thinking is practiced by the reader. Now many people may be offended by that statement, but we'll be quickly going into why that is so. There we go. Maybe I need to stand. Is there... <clears throat> the status quo, or our existing state of affairs, is in conflict with human needs for survival. The storm of irrationality has three major components, and give me just a second. Censorship or secrecy, which is the act of occulting information. Corruption of education, which leaves you intellectually self-defenseless. And three, absence of nonviolent communication, which prevents constructive action. Ending secrecy and revealing the truth does not automatically give people critical thinking. Providing intellectual self-defense does not automatically prevent censorship, nor does it teach how to communicate. Learning how to communicate does not end, uh, does not end in secrecy, nor does it provide critical thinking. So let's begin by defining 13 simple concepts. Number one, axiom of non-aggression is the ethical stance which asserts that aggression is inherently illegitimate. Aggression is defined as the, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to have to keep that bottle of water open. Oh, you, went, you skipped, okay, there we go. Okay. Aggression is defined as the initiation of physical force against persons or property, the threat of such or fraud upon persons or their property. In contrast to pacifism, the non-aggression principle does not preclude violent self-defense. The principle is a deontological or rule-based ethical stance. Education to bring about, to extract, to provide a form of, or uh, to produce from a state of occultation. Or in other words, to take out of the hidden. From the Latin verb ecuo, Educo, excuse me, to lead out or draw out. Occult from the Latin verb occulto, to hide or to keep secret. Therefore, education is the process of unocculting reality. Autonomy from ancient Greek, auto self, and nomos law, one who gives 
oneself, their own law, is a concept found in moral, political, and bioethical philosophy. Within these contexts, it refers to the capacity of a rational individual to make an informed, uncoerced decision. Government is derived from the Latin word gubernare, a verb meaning to control, combined with mente, a Latin noun meaning mind. Government means to control the mind. <laughs> Cybernetics from the Greek, kybernetes, is a steersman, a governor, pilot, rudder, the same root as government, a broad field of study which includes equations to control human behavior via language. In other words, if the purpose of government is to control the mind, cybernetics would be the instruction manual on how to control your mind. And this will mean more when we get into Norma, Norbert Wiener in, uh, in about probably about 20 or 30 minutes. Conspiracy from the Latin verb conspire. To conspire is the act of occulting information in order to prey on those who have been denied access to the same set of useful information. Terrorism, government by force, and of course that's from the Oxford English Dictionary, so any terrorism so-called that you find out there, that is governments committing those things to govern the people. Missing a lack of awareness or knowledge as a consequence, oh, and I forget I have this microphone in my hand, that would help, huh? <laughs> a can't consequence of never having had the choice or opportunity to be exposed to it. Had they been exposed to awareness or knowledge, it would have been integrated into their thoughts and actions had they only been given the opportunity. Ignorant, someone who is aware of a concept or knowledge and yet does not integrate this information and thus are resistant to learning by their own choice or choosing not to learn, which is also denial. Liber, this is a very important concept that everybody needs to get familiar with. Liber is the Latin word for book, and it also is also the word for freedom, and thus the root word of liberty. That's where we put books in. We put them in libraries, liber, libraries. Reading books provides the road to cognitive liberty and freedom. Nonviolent communication, observing without judgment. We process our feelings and identify mutual needs whereby we can communicate in order to meet the needs of all parties. And thanks to Jose here for turning me on to Dr. Marshall Rosenberg's work. If the word government literally means to control the mind, wouldn't learning how to control your own mind negate the opportunity for external government? It is a simple act of asking questions which illustrates Achilles' heel of the control system. You can condition animals, but if humans ask questions, they can learn their way to freedom. The absence of government is anarchy, not autonomy. Absence of someone else controlling your mind does not automatically give you critical thinking, so it's more logical, reasonable, and rational to learn how, how to learn anything for ourselves and thereby becoming autonomous, which is what Bob Tuscan talked of this morning, whereby external mind control or government is no longer necessary. <coughs> government to control the mind is a form of aggression when it is used against your consent. Top secrecy is a form of aggression as it denies you the opportunity, opportunity to make an, an informed choice. 16 million documents were made top secret by our government here in the U.S. last year. <laughs> top secrecy is occulted information. Information is power. The occulting of information creates a differential in power. Informa the information gap is the power gap. That one's a little small there. The wealth gap, etc. Does the superclass which runs the world have superpowers? They do, in a sense. Their superpowers to have access to a systematic method to attain certainty, while at the same time denying you access to the same liberating tools. The purpose of this lesson is to, or this lecture, is to transfer superpowers of the non-elected rulers to you so that you understand exactly how they manipulate information and, and do mind control, whereby you can inspect, validate, and install your own superpowers of learning. And after you leave this lecture, you should be able to, <coughs> excuse me, empower others. Without access to the occulted information and the intellectual to toolkit to allow you to take actions with certainty, it is a rigged game ensuring consistency, satisfaction, and order for those who occult the information. And uncertainly, uncertainty, fear, confusion, and chaos for those without access to the information and tools of learning. 
Without learning to outgrow our current situation, many of us react emotionally and cannot outthink our reactions, devolving our state of response ability to that of our fight or flight, powered by adrenaline. Emotions are not a valid method of attaining knowledge, and we tend to panic instead of responding to the unknown with observation, logical thought, and informed action to make it known. Who is doing this to us? Polymaths who possess rationality without emotion. Many groups have espoused this obsession to control the lives of others, atonists, eugenicists, ego worshipers. They all support controlling you via the censorship and manipulation of information, AKA the, the scientific <clears throat> dictatorship, wherein information is used to control rather than liberate you. Examples illustrating the idea of scientific di dictatorship. Edward Bernays, who was also discussed this morning by Bob. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is, is an important element in a democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mecha mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as smoothly functioning society. In almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who will pull the wires which control the public mind. And that is from the very first paragraph in Edward Bernays' book, Propaganda. Walter Lippmann. We have learned to call this propaganda a group of men who can pre prevent independent access to the event can arrange the news to suit their purpose. In order to conduct a propaganda campaign, there must be some barrier between the public and the event, like 911, for instance. Access to the real environment must be limited before anyone can create a pseudo environment he thinks wise or desirable. B.F. Skinner the creator of the famous Skinner box that they would put rats in to do tests. And <clears throat> give me a child and I'll shape him into anything. Bertrand Russell. Education should be aimed at destroying free will so that after pupils have left school, they shall be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. Norbert Wiener, author of Cybernetics. As I have already hinted, one of the directions of work which the realm of ideas of the Mercy Meetings has suggested concerns the importance of the notion and the technique of communication in the social, social system. It is certainly true that the social system is an organization like the individual that is bound together by a system of communication and that, that it has a dynamics in which circular processes of a feedback nature play an important part. This is true both in general fields of anthropology and sociology and in the more specific fields of economics and the very important work of von Neumann and Morgenstern on the theory of games enters into this range of ideas. On this basis, Dr. Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead, and those of you who may remember the famous quote, never doubt that a small group of people can change the world, indeed it's the only thing that ever has. She's not talking about you activists out there, people. She's talking about the elites and how they were, use, a small group of people was creating ideas to control the masses for their own gain. I can't tell you how many hippies I've seen with that sticker. <laughs> Uh, let's see, have urged me in view of the intensely pressing nature of the sociological and economic problems of the present age of confusion to devote a lot, large part of my energies to the discussion of this side of cybernetics. Aldous Huxley, and he wasn't one of our guys either. A real efficient totalitarian, totalitarian state would be one in which the all-powerful executive of political bosses and their army of managers control a population of slaves who do not have to be coerced because they love their servitude. That's exactly what the corporate media marketing PR society that we live in is today. To make them love, to make them love it is the task assigned in present day totalitarian states to ministries of propaganda. The CFR, Council on Foreign Relations, is a PR organization. 
Newspaper editors, school teachers, the greatest triumphs of propaganda have been accomplished not by doing something, but by refraining from doing. Great is truth, but greater, but still greater, from a practical point of view, is silence about truth. And part two, the secret of secret societies. There are many artifacts which illustrate that the craft of masonry is much older than its public eruption in Great Britain in the 1700s. The Wood Manuscript, Circa 1610, begins by proclaim, proclaiming that masonry has always been associated with grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And I'll point out that that presentation is actually out of order, which is very important for all of you to realize. It is always grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. It is very important for the elites to mix the proper order up so that people cannot free their minds. This is an unmistakable reference to the seven liberal arts composed of the trivium, which is grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the quadrivium, which is arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And these are the ancient mystery arts. And these ancient subjects lost to the Christian world during the Dark Ages and preserved in the Middle East by Arab scholars until the Crusades. Albert Pike's magnum opus, Morals and Dogma, on page 861, proclaims that the royal secret of the sublime prince is found in the understanding of the Pythagorean triangle, which I meant to show at the beginning of the lecture, but I forgot to put it in the slide, so my apologies. It's basically a triangle with five, three, four on either side, the five representing the five senses, the three representing the trivium, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the four representing the quadrivium, math, geometry, music, and astronomy. In observing with our five senses, we process this input using the trivium and quantify our reality using number and its many forms via the quadrivium as a measure of understanding. Morals and Dogma also brings to mind the Masonic Credo, order out of chaos, allegedly a metaphor illuminating the source of Masonic power and their ability to create chaos out of which they can maintain control and assert order. Learning is the process of establishing order over chaos, or the method of transmuting chaos into order using the three steps of the trivium. The method of transmuting order out of chaos is only evil if it is held by one side and used against the other. This is the consequence of a culting of useful tools of learning. By reintroducing these concepts to those who are not in the secret societies and thus under no oaths of secrecy, we can effectively dissolve the power <clears throat> which the non-elected rulers use to assert their control over the masses one mind at a time without violating anyone's free will. The esoteric message of the symbols and words used by the perfectibilists, better known as the Illuminati, render even more interesting discoveries of learning. The owl represents a predator that can see in the dark while you cannot, referring to the fact that those in the, in the society can see occulted information while you cannot. The triangle represents the trinity, or three-step process of systematic learning, and can quote, and the quote, per me casey vident, which that's bad slaughtering of Latin, which translates to, through me, the blind become sighted. Likewise refers to the process of learning, a process which, if not shared equally, can be used as a weapon giving great power to the few and used to the control the many. If the word light is derived from lux, might the process of shedding light be equated to unoculting of information, learning, or education? Might someone in the past have sought to cloak the power of learning by making others without access to the tools of learning to think that it is evil or even an adversary? so as to use fear to present, prevent others from making meaningful discoveries and sharing knowledge with others. That might begin with the reason for the, for the reason why our most precious natural resource, our ability to develop our mental capacity, has been subverted over the past centuries. No, now that we know that A, there is a method to learning anything, and B, that the method has been occulted and held as a primary secret of the secret societies because they can prevent you from learning likewise, giving them a favorable, favorable advantage in power differential or leverage. <clears throat> Since much of the information we need to understand our history has been occulted, 
And it's through the processing of reading books that we can liberate our minds and exercise our freedom of speech and communication to better progress our understandings through a common language of interaction with others. This is the process by which, as individuals, we help each other to free our minds. All learning begins with an observation, and if our curiosity is healthy and hasn't been poisoned by our questioning of that observation, leaves leads us to learn our way forward by asking substantial questions and finding valid answers. Is there a relationship between the quality of our judgments or decisions and the quality of our lives? If you observe that there is a direct relationship between the quality of your judgments and the quality of your life, then the question becomes, what is the method by which you can improve the quality of your judgments and decisions? Simply to undermine your ability to make quality decisions and accurate judgments. This is done by occulting information, secrets which are protected by oaths and other forms of coercion. If the status quo is fueled by our poor judgment and simultaneously the status quo is in direct conflict with human needs of survival, might improving our ability to make quality decisions and accurate judgments resolve the ongoing conflict? What is the biggest threat to the ruling class? Are they genetically superior than us? What do they do out there that makes them better, wealthier, have more information than the rest of us? Or have they been provided with, <clears throat> excuse me, with tools to attain a higher level of perspective, thus making them our intellectual superiors through the occulting of information and corruption of public education? Might the method by which one learns how to learn anything for oneself, autodidactics, as Bob mentioned this morning, uh, anything for oneself be the biggest secret? It is through our obs observation of no that knowledge exists and the observation that the occulting of information by one side creates an imbalance of power. This imbalance provides the opportunity for predators to create their own prey, to make slaves out of those who are not privy to the occulted or secret information. Whether it is the three-card Monty or shell game on a city street or it's a Ponzi screen <laughs> scheme being used to steal trillions from millions of people, <coughs> those in the know who seek power through the occulting of information use this gap in knowledge to act as their fulcrum. The more secret, or the more secrets, excuse me, the greater their leverage. How do you know if you're being fooled? Do you notice that sometimes honest people are providing information which is dishonest, not as an intentional attempt to deceive you, but rather because they have not validated that which they are t attempting to pass on to you as quote unquote knowledge? How can we attain higher degrees of certainty by learning how to discern fact from fiction? We can start by defining what is meant by knowledge. It can be said that we live in a symbolic world, and all knowledge is a function of how communities of knowers construe and manipulate symbols. Knowledge plays an important role in communication, as does logic, the combination of which equates to rhetoric, which pertains to the expression of knowledge, if this process is uncorrupted and remains in integrity within the law of identity. It is through this knowledge, or rather, the, the ability to construe and manipulate symbols that rhetoric is formed, and this is the process by which the polymaths govern. And in that realization, one might recognize the concepts which embody those who govern. All knowledge starts with observation through the five senses. This is the genesis of thinking, and as, as uh, Bob quoted... Uh, uh, Erica Goldson this morning, are you if you're not thinking through a process, are you really thinking at all? This is the genesis of thinking as a process of identification to validate the contents which we store as memory. It has been said that judgment without observation is the epitome of ignorance, while observation without judgment is the epitome of wisdom. But why is observation without judgment so important? Because in order to reach a point of decision or judgment, one has to think as a method to get there. And observation is not the end result of judgment. Rather, it is the starting point for thinking to occur. 
What is thinking but an ongoing process of, identi of achieving identification and the process of inferring these identifications into a body of logically connected knowledge? Is the world governed by people who are our intellectually, intellectual inferiors? Certainly not. What creates an opportunity for, the, for a con man to take advantage of his prey? Thinking is the process of asking the questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how. We've all heard these. That's it. It's really simple. Finding valid, <coughs> excuse me, and finding valid answers whereby you can make an informed decision or accurate judgment. Is it because we have all observed contradictions in our perspective of reality which have sparked our curiosity and initiated us on a process of thinking whereby we seek to learn how to remove our misunderstandings about the world and communicate this newfound understandings to others? Isn't that why we're all here? The root cause of what makes us aware that, some, that something is wrong is that we are com comparing and contrasting that which we observe to that which we have experienced in the past. The root cause of what makes us aware that something is wrong is that we are comparing and contrasting that which we observe now to that which we have experienced in the past. We can all remember a time when we had a greater degrees of liberty, and by comparing and contrasting the past to the present, we sense a decline in our way of life. This comparison or contrast is the basis of the duality of our shared physical reality. Without contrast, there would be no way to discern one thing from another, which is the essence of unity or non-duality. We, we are all familiar with the corporations <laughs> We are all familiar with how corporations identify themselves with logos. In the ancient Greek, logos, often translated as word or number, originally meant ratio. The Pythagoreans developed a theory of ratio and proportion as applied to numbers. Early translators rendered this into Latin as ratio, meaning reason, as in rational. Medieval writers used the word proportio or proportion to indicate ratio and proportionalitas, proportionality for the quality of ratio. It is innate to humans that we have the ability to form and use ratios and thus to be rational. This is the key to what makes us human, our ability to recognize and use letters, thus building words, creating sentences, writing paragraphs, and sharing information beyond our lifetime. Just as one might build an entire city of bricks, there is an entire reality built from letters, words, and language, and we are all aware that all too often in history, words have been used to create invisible pris prisons and to enslave minds. Victor Frankl made an observation through which we can all come to understand the essence of what is to be human beings. Between stimulus and response, there is a space, and in that space is our freedom. To choose to think or not to think, to learn or not to learn, those are the questions we should be interested in. As humans, we implicitly learn in a variety of ways, but we do this inconsistently and without accuracy or precision. It is in the explicit observation of how our natural ability to learn actually works where we find the key to learning anything we want in life. As I'll show, there is really only one question we need to be asking. And it is by using this single word or question that we can unlock our minds and truly begin to explore through a methodology of critical thinking and creative problem solving. Can anybody here answer what that question or that word would be? Anyone? Why? It's the word what, and it helps if you put a question mark behind it. What is the identity of blank? What is the process and purpose of thinking? Thinking is the process of identification. To use a metaphor, if you equate the process of learning to the process of eating, thinking is where you identify what is and what is not food so that you do not poison yourself as eating without thinking could, you, could lead you to consume something which is not food. Thinking is a tool of survival and is necessary to humans who are volitional beings, meaning that there is a space to be filled in, and in that space we make our choices. What is the process and purpose of thinking? It starts when we question our observations 
and, initiate, and initiates a process by which we learn to answer our own questions. What is identity? The result of the process of elimination resulting in a non-contradictory label. It is in observing similarities and differences that we define a concept, and once defined, we label it. This is the process of iterating the genre, and differentia, or similarities and contrast, allows one to see a concept in focus. Once a concept is defined or labeled, it can be further identified by asking who, what, where, when, why, and how. We all know these questions as the five W's plus how, questions which should be answered in a quality piece of journalism. But in reality, there is only one question, as I mentioned, asked in six different ways. Who translate, translates as what is the identity, identity of the person involved? What translates as what is the identity of the subject, concept, or topic involved? Like this is the topic of the trivium. My name is Jan Irvin. We're here in Philadelphia at the Ruba Hall. So now we have an identity without contradiction. Where, and I just answer that, Ruba Hall, translates as what is the identity of the location or place? When, now. What is the identity of the time? Why translates as, what is the identity of the cause? How translates as, what is the identity of the means or process? It is in asking the question, what is the identity of blank, that thinking takes place. As it is the process of grasping identification, and this is logic. Logic is the art of non-contradictory identification. This is the essence of human communication and being that we've all learned, all been deprived of it. It is no wonder that we're all here looking for something and now we can identify what that is. It is also useful to define the concept of proof at this point and proof is the process of deriving a conclusion step by step from the directly given evidence of the senses, each step in accordance with the law of identity, which is logic. Once concepts are mutually defined, communication becomes much more efficient and effective. In essence, any agreed upon definition acts as a common ground for successful communication. If you are attempting to communicate with someone and cannot agree on common definitions, communication cannot take place. This is the basis of irrationality. If identities <clears throat> cannot be defined, logic is not present, and the conversation is, then is apparently about nothing. If there is a failure to communicate, it is likely that there is a contradiction in identification where reaffirming mutual agreement on definitions or identification will most likely remedy the situation. This is a common thread between humans and computers and why we can use computers to communi communicate. The way I'm communicating with you right now is identical to how commu computers communicate in a techno <laughs> excuse me, without the hiccups, <laughs> in a techno technological sense, we all speak in code, and if you have the decoder, in this case, English, you can understand what I'm saying, but guess what? If you have Chinese or German out there and I'm speaking English, we're not getting the same code unless you're have more codes. And even if you have to look up, you know, uh, you can understand what I'm saying even if you have to look up the words. A code is defined as communication between an encoder, a writer, or speaker, that's me, and a decoder, reader, or listener, the audience, that's you, using agreed upon symbols, in this case, the English alphabet and English language and an English dictionary. The essence of communication, and this is by Claude Shannon, the source transmitter, and what happens, you get Communication coming across this way from me to you guys, the audience. Then we have noise in the middle, like the, the sound of the fan in the middle there from the projector. That's a little bit of a noise source there. But uh, the noise is what corrupts the signal. And basically, that's when you go back and define the terms that you're using to communicate, make, making sure that you have clarity of signal. Nope. 
1948, Claude Shannon, an American polymath, published his paper, that The Mathematical Theory of Communication, which earned him a place in history as the father of information theory. Shannon's work is How Communication Works is the Foundation Principle in how communication works is the foundation principle for the electronic age as it is used in computers and practically every communication device or electronic gadget, including all your phones in your pockets. It is in recognizing the input processing and output pattern that we can learn how our own processes of communication is, uh, is undermined. You have an idea, you express it, and the person to whom you're speaking Looks as if your message has been lost in translation. If you agree on the definitions, i.e. the coded language used to transmit the message, whether in English or binary code, the next step would be to identify the source of noise in the message, specifically identifying that which is the message and that which is not. This is the logical processing. Humans and computers differ insofar that humans sometimes attempt to deceive each other and or communicate information which is not validated. Both instances create chaos or noise which can dissolve the integrity of the message. A fallacy is an error in our logical thinking process. The word fallacy derives from the Latin fallare, to deceive. A fallacy is an error in our logical thinking process. The word, oh, oh that's a, got copied twice there. If someone is unaware of the myriad of fallacies in, in existence, their use, if recognized by you, might be construed as innocent. If someone is knowledgeable about the fallacies and is attempting to deceive you by using them, if recognized by you, can be addressed and you can avoid taking in toxic information and filing it into your memory as truth. However, when so much information is held secret and so many Fables are therefore circulated as truth. It is hard to achieve a clear focus on reality. Thinking is the process of bringing our mind into focus on the subject or concept to be identified. So what, so what would happen if the properties of identification are withheld from you, the public? You become the external enemy, the profane public, the, stu the stupid gullible masses, etc., uh, who are left blind and in the dark. This is the nature of encryption and cryptography, which Claude Shannon also miracu miraculously elaborated in the simplest terms. You have a message source going through. It's encrypted. You have the key source. In this case, I'm speaking English. You all have the key source of English to understand what I'm saying. It gets decrypted and the message goes out. If you do not have the key source, the information goes through and you don't get the message. And Shannon also created communication secrecy systems method, which occults information, the key source, denying someone outside of the secret society the ability to read the messages. This is useful to understand as it is access to the key which enables the rest of us to decrypt our reality. Yes, the occulting of information is the encryption of our reality, and this will enable you to see some of the understandings related in films like The Matrix. If the world has been pulled over our eyes, then education is the process of getting back to reality. In ancient Hindu, Ram is a word for God. Today, in the 21st century, it refers to memory. Might these concepts be connected? This diagram illustrates the similarities and differences between you and your computer. It's also titled Your Computer and You, and I thought that it might help to uh, help you get more out of this lesson. So up at the top, we have the awareness of fraud. We have a virus scan, awareness of virus definitions, spam filters, aware awareness of fraudulent identity, logic processor or process of identification, hard drive or memory or storage, an output device, DVD, email, etc., what you transmit on to others. It is likely that we all have a computer and just like, and like we just learned from, from Shannon, there are three basic steps to making it useful. One input, two processing, and three output. The cycle repeated consistently makes it a useful tool. Your computer in, in, in the simplest terms is a code or operating system which runs on a chip made of sand and stored as memory as rust on disk and might cost a few thousand dollars. You might connect your computer to the internet, an input, 
You then might have a firewall, a virus scan, a spam filter in place before you let your processor get to work and eventually store it to memory whereby it can be recalled and output to a printer, disk, or sent back out through the internet as communication. If all pieces work synergistically, the computer is useful and generates satisfaction, serenity, and if not, it causes frustration and confusion, such as computer crashes and, you know, your, your computer doesn't work. So if you have a bunch of viruses and crap in your computer, does your computer work well? Anyone? No. It's even more likely that we all have a brain. <laughs> Some of you probably have computers, we all have a brain. And like we just learned from Shannon, there are three basic steps to making it useful. Input, processing, and output. This cycle, when likewise repeated consistently, makes our minds a useful tool. And if we don't have a system, what do we have? We can get viruses, spam, all kinds of junk, malware. So here we are again. Awareness of force or fraud, the firewall is critical thinking. Awareness of virus definitions. And if you have a virus scanner, if you don't update your virus scanner every day, is it able to see the latest viruses? Of course not. It has to have the latest virus definitions so that it can identify the viruses and remove them from logic. If you don't have a process of identifying the information going into your brain, you don't have any way of identifying or defining those issues. And then spam filter, awareness of how to find validity or valid identity. Logic processor, asking the five W's plus how. And then mind is memory or storage. Output, thinking, speaking, taking action. This is the output, me speaking to the crowd. Your mind in simplest terms is the operating system of the brain which is the most complex organism in the known physical universe and is priceless compared to the couple grand you might spend on your computer. Your body literally can't leave home without it. So why do we spend all this money on virus scanners, spam filters, firewalls, all this stuff for our computers and yet very few of us spend anything on our brains for the same reasons. You might have access to all five of your senses to observe and interact with the environment. This is the input. You then might have a firewall, an awareness of the observation that, that pre predators do exist. You might have a virus scan, which is an awareness of the fact that information lacking integri integrity can disrupt your ability to think and act. You might also have a spam filter, which is an awareness that some predators use false identities in an attempt to deceive you. Through the use of logical processing, asking the five W's plus how, these contradictions can be identified, thus allowing you to avoid the, conf the confidence scheme as it only works if you're intellectually self-defenseless. At this point, you might store this validated information in memory where it can be recalled and output by thinking, talking, or doing. If all pieces of work Synergistically, if all pieces work synergistically, the mind is useful and generates satisfaction and serenity. If not, it causes frustration and confusion. So the question is, given this information, why do we all seem to invest more in our computers than we do in the workings of our own minds? It seems we've been fooled into, into misprioritizing what is most precious and sold on a systematic form of undermining our right of self-determination through some very clever marketing thanks to a few egocentric polymaths. When we fail to exercise our choice to think or not to think, we become our own oppressors. What happens if we do not have a firewall, virus scan, and spam filter running at all times? We lose our choice as it is in these three steps wherein we evaluate and assert our decisions. It is in the turning off of our awareness through the false creation or attribution of trust whereby, whereby we become controlled, literally. For it is in the input where the propaganda and the deception enter into our mind through the five senses and without questioning we store it as factual truth and memory. Our choice is self-usurped and outsourced to whatever input we are exposed to because we have lost the security to ask the big question, the big word, what? And the discipline to ask it in six different ways consistently and thereby we've lost our free will. This is what the ruling elite hold over us. 
You are free only when you understand yourself in relationship to your surroundings, and this changes as, you've, as you move through the world. However, the common thread which creates the fabric of knowledge is the observation that learning is the path to freedom. And referring back to the communication systems theory, this is the key to unlocking our own minds, decrypting our rea reality, enabling us to take actions which inspire others to do likewise. War has both mental and physical characteristics. There can no be no support for physical warfare if first there is not mental support which facilitates the, phys the physical action. To defeat your enemy, you must break their will to control you. In order to break their will, you must break their ability to control your mind. It is only when information is occulted that the appearance of the truth can be disfigured, and it is in this intellectual corruption whereby human beings can be tricked into dehumanizing and thus rationalizing the use of aggression, fraud, and coercion on other human beings and their communities. The buck stops here. Here's where all of this lecture pays off. We are standing on the top of the single most powerful learning methodology which produces progress with ever increasing degrees of certainty. But first, there's one more word to learn. The trivium. Latin for where three roads meet, what three roads? The input, processing, and output which when used in a systematic ordered repetition produces satisfaction. At this point, I'm going to have you elevate your own sense of perspective, thereby transmuting your natural implicit ability to learn into an explicit form of intellectual self-defense. The input, how to observe. This is simply defined by knowledge resulting from answering who, what, where, and when. This input or knowledge is referred to as general grammar of a concept or idea. General grammar is the connecting of human concepts or word concepts into objective reality. The processing, how to think. This is simply the understanding which results from answering why. It is the art of thinking without contradiction or non-contradictory identification. This processing or thinking is referred to as logic. The output, how to communicate, this is simply the communication of knowledge and understanding or wisdom which precipitates from answering the question, how? Damn. It is in taking the grammar and applying logic that creates what is referred to as rhetoric or the expression of wisdom. However, if an audience lacks intellectual self-defense and does not question the rhetoric they consume, they can soon be misled. This is why it is imperative that we, the people, become skilled in the art of using these three steps and this three-step process known as the trivium method of critical thinking and creative problem solving. Whether referred to as input, processing, and output, or how to observe, how to think, how to communicate, or knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, or grammar, logic, and rhetoric, it's all referring to the identical, implicit, and natural process we all have as human beings. This is why it is removed from the public education system and preserved within the elite universities, mystery schools, and secret societies. It is the single secret which allows them to create and maintain power in the first place by amputating our curiosity and the, the ability to learn for ourselves, making us dependent on teachers in Pavlovian classrooms using Wundtian implementations of experimental psychology to condition us like Skinner's pigeons where we can read just enough to be efficiently and effectively controlled. B.F. Skinner de deprived his pigeons of food and then used food to corrupt the actions of the birds and our non-elected rulers deprive us of information and money and then the use of these and then the use of these deficiencies to corrupt our actions in their favor. This is the root cause of why the status quo is in direct conflict with human needs of survival. This is why in the 15,000 hours you spent in public schooling, you did not, they did not teach you that in which you... Oh wait. In the 15,000 hours you spent in public schooling, did not teach you that which you've learned within this one hour lesson. It is the most important thing which can be taught, and yet it is conspicuously absent from our status quo. Now, a couple of quick examples to give you the best grip on uh, possible on this set of perspectives, and this thing is driving me crazy. 
If you have ever been out of your neighborhood and gotten hungry, it's likely, like today, that you've had the experience of ordering from an unfamiliar restaurant. Uh, you observe the menu, you think about what you would like, and then you order and eat your meal. These steps, observe, think, order. You don't eat, order, and then think about what you want. And look, look at the menu. That would be illogical. Grammar is the definitions or knowledge, what's on the menu. Logic is the process of thinking, comparing what you like to the menu, and assuring you don't eat a contradiction to what brings you satisfaction. Rhetoric is the process of ordering and eating the meal. Three, I think I may have skipped one there. It seems almost every television channel has a police crime scene, invest or in scene investigation show, and yet, ironically, too few in this world can actually recognize, investigate, and solve any of the myriad of mega crimes and grand theft world going on. In these shows, the grammar, logic, and rhetoric process is the repetitive theme, the system or method by which the crimes are solved. First, there is an awareness and definition of the crime scene, which then goes back to the lab to think through the evidence and identify and remove contradictions, whereby the connection to the criminal having been made, the arrest can take place. Grammar, logic, rhetoric, a wheel of power, which the hel hel helmsmen use to steer the rest of us through life. This is the essence of how to start instantly, to instantly introduce equilibrium to the world, one free mind at a time. And lastly, if you haven't gotten the hang of it yet, one more example. Everyone here has purchased a project which comes with an instruction manual. Every single instruction manual with integrity uses grammar, logic, and rhetoric, or the trivium method to communicate the value of the concept, ideal product, etc. The individual parts are always first, defined and usually illustrated. This is the general grammar of the prod product. Next, the manual will show you how all the parts fit together, illustrating how the knowledge of the individual parts are interconnected, which produces your understanding, thus allowing successful assembly of the product. This is the logic of the product manual. And lastly, the instruction manual articulates how to properly use and troubleshoot the product, and this is the rhetoric. Picture a circle divided into three equal parts, these three roads, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, when used in that specific order, repetitively with, this, with active learning engaged, produces ever-increasing degrees of certainty. If you rotate the circle and progress it horizontally, it creates a line of repeating steps, grammar, logic, rhetoric, grammar, logic, rhetoric, etc. And this is a comprehensive decision-making process. It is, this, it is the process used to deceive all of us to lock our own minds early in life and, uh, as being deprived of this simple natural reflection of the human learning process. We accept whatever feels emotionally pleasant as truth, and that does not compute if you'll excuse the irony. Critical thinking cannot be effectively taught in a, in a curriculum as it is a skill which results from the process of thinking and learning and is driven by the grammar, logic, and rhetoric cycle of observation, thought, and action. The purpose of grammar is to bring initial and consistent order to a body of knowledge. The purpose of logic is to extract understanding from the body of knowledge. Rhetoric is the cogent explanation of that body of knowledge, and if done effectively, this is known as teaching. When one realizes that they desire to change their environment either as recognition of, of a problem or the inspiration of a, a new creation or improvement, the learning process is necessary. This is, this is why this use of our five senses processed by the trivium and integrated into our comprehension via the quadrivium is embodied in the famous 5-3-4 triangle of Pythagoras, which I forgot to put in there. One of the requirements to enter Plato's academy was knowledge of geometry, refers to, which refers to Pythagoras and the fact that if you don't know how to learn anything for yourself by asking substantial questions and obtaining valid answers, you cannot possibly contribute or benefit to a school which operates on the prerequisite of autonomy or self-governance. And in ancient times, students were taught the, tr the trivium at home by their parents as a prerequisite before admission into the universities. Now you know why the secret societies, including the Brothers Masons and Illuminati, conceal this secret from the public. Because any single person who understands what I'm saying or can learn to understand what I'm saying is now impervious to the control system. <laughs> this learning process is a vaccination of information, inoculating you from predatory forces on this planet, specifically from those who use knowledge of how your mind works to undermine your thoughts, feelings, and actions. The hope exists 
And the simple fact that you can hear me, that you can work to grasp my meaning, and that a little thinking, with a little thinking, we can all begin to reflect the change we wish to see in the world, and thereby making this convergence of will a success long into the future. And problems cannot be solved at the same level of consciousness which created them. Certificate of participation Thank for you. Uh, being here, and thank you so much for your Thank interview. you. Appreciate it.